Okay, we are going through neural networks. So last week we went from non-neural networks. This week it's all neural networks today. This week, so we'll start on that. So I'll keep these open for you guys also, and, and then I'll enlarge these the pictures when I want to explain something to you guys. All right. So definition. Neural net network is a computational model, model inspired by the way human brains process information. Okay. Contrast with non-neural networks, unlike traditional models, like we said last week, neural networks can learn complex patterns and, and representations. Like we'll take a look here. You guys can see here. You see, like this, this is the human brain, and these are two uh, two neurons of like accepting from each other. And this is what it looks like in, in the neural networks. So there's, it's transmitting information from these nodes. It's going to this neuron and then to the next neuron. And then this is kind of what it, what it looks like. It's like branched, right? And they're, they're receiving information from each other, right? That's how it looks like inside the human brain like from, a, from a biological perspective. But this is what it looks like in, in human perspective right here. This is what it looks like. So, focus of the lecture today is going to be an in depth discussion on various neural network architectures and their applications. Uh, similarities of concepts from pre previous class emphasize on some foundational principles. Examples of use case, real world applications. So we're going to look at image recognition, natural language processing, healthcare diagnostics. For the pros and cons, they have a, an ability to learn from data, adaptability to complex problems, performance improvements over traditional methods in certain tasks. Cons, they're often seen as black boxes, difficult to interpret and understand. Uh, dependence on large data sets for effective training, deep, deep learning and neural networks, they need a lot of data. So it's not like the small amounts of data we use in non-neural networks. These, these need a lot of data to train. Okay, cons, like we said, they depend on uh, large data sets and the risk of over-reliance on AI for decision-making. So you're gonna rely on AI for everything, basically. That's one of its cons also. Food for thought, reflect on the irony that AI means invented. Despite mimicking human intelligence, uh, AI highlights human cognitive weaknesses, such as the reluctance to learn from mistakes. An analogy here, consider uh, the toaster analogy. AI technology is fundamentally about, about input, storage, processing, and output. Yet it still falls short of replicating true human cognition. So we're not there yet. Like we're, That's what we're trying to do, is, is make AI uh, think like humans and, and, and like be fully cognitive like humans and even surpass human intelligence, which is what they're working on right now. For conclusion, while neural networks can enhance capabilities, they also pose challenges and risks, particularly in decision making. A uh, context where trust and AI accuracy is crucial. So everything has to be like accurate because they put a lot of trust on So history, like I said here, look, take a look at this. So we kind of saw the human brain. We saw how like uh, they're connected. You see how like one neuron gives the information to the other neuron, right? So right here, layer one, fucking layer now, we're going deep in layers, right? Layer one here is the X's, these are the inputs. This is the input data, which can be like uh, a text, right? Be a text like uh, you're asking uh, uh, Chat GPT how how much is something or what is one plus two or something like that. That's going to be an input right here, this input layer, okay? And these are the deep layers, the hidden layers. That's what we call deep because they're hidden, right? This is layer one. This is layer two, and these can be a billion layers, just like in Chat GPT or something. This is this is the architecture of Chat GPT and. and Gemini and other, you know, all the other models. And uh, this layer right here is the output layer. So I asked a question here, it answers it here, it gets processed in these layers right here. And these can be like a million layers, 
or billions now. You know what I mean? And uh, this is where all the magic happens. So I have these layers right here. So, and you also, you also can notice that each node here in the input has to pass through all three of these layers. Like this one has to go through all three. This one, also all three. This one, all three. And then when you come to this layer, the information is also passing through this layer too. Like this one, all three. Connects to all three, connects to all three. You notice that? Right here, that they, they're they branching like through every, every, every each one. And this is where the output is. Like this is where you ask the question, it gets processed here in the middle in these deep layers, and then this is where you get your output. Yes. Uh, quick question. So yes. why aren't there two hidden layers? Why why is that necessary? Why is it necessary? Yeah, why because you... if we're processing like um, very complex data, you're gonna need to have more hidden layers in there. Uh, you know what I mean? This this is a shallow network. Yeah. You know like how shallow and deep waters? Yeah. This is shallow water, so you can stand in it. This is deep so water. It's input layer one. So this input to layer one, and then layer two is just hidden, where it goes to like a lot of These information. These layers are the hidden layers, yep. And then it goes to layer three, kind of like more in depth of yes. information. And that's what we have. Okay. It's making more computations. Got it. So this, and these can be like uh, layer, layer two here has three nodes, right? Layer three here also has three nodes. Layer two can have five or ten nodes, neurons. I mean, these are neurons, right? You can have uh, ten neurons. This can have fifteen neurons, depending on the complexity of what we're working with, right? And this is out right here. Are the issues? So so the history. Origins, the concept of artificial intelligence inspired by human cognition beginning in the 1940s, like we discussed uh, last week. Uh, a time where neuroscience was the primary focus. Early computers were designed to, to, uh, to emulate human thought processes reflecting desire to model natural systems. Evolution of computing, the term computer originally referred to a person performing calculations. These were called computers back then, just guys sitting on uh, these tablets making calculations. They were called computers, okay? With the invention of the transistor, you know, you guys know what the transistor is, okay? Inside the microchips. You don't need to know that. It's, it's, you, can, you can ship it out there. So they made the transistors in the 50s. It's basically what made the CPUs of the computers to make all the calculations. The building block of the CPU. The neuroscience influence on AI here, terms like neuron and AI remain unchanged from their biological uh, counterparts, although artificial neural networks only mimic con cognitive processes, like we said here. So it's, it's mimicking the cognitive processes inside the human brain. Early models of neural networks, the perceptron we talked about, it's like a, a very simple neural, neural network made by Frank Rosenbaum in uh, 57. Uh, it served as a foundational model for understanding neural functions in, in networks. Processes the inputs, X, Y, and Z, whatever they are, through parameters of weights and biases like we talked about uh, yes, uh, last week. Their limitations is the technology in the 50s was uh, rudimentary. It wasn't that high. So we didn't have that much, uh, uh, that good of hardware to make these computations, these very complex computations back then, but we do have them now. So we advanced, like I said, in the 80s, increased computational power, saw some significant approvals in the in AI neural networks. And then they started the GPU architecture, where, which we know GPUs are graphic processing units, right? Like uh, if you guys have a gaming laptop or something, you'll see that it has like an NVIDIA GPU, an AMD GPU, right? To keep your games graphics higher or, or movies, if you're watching in 4K or 8K, you need higher. Uh, GPUs and GPUs are what uh, are used extensively these days in training uh, deep learning. Right? So we start. They started the deep learning revolution uh, in the early two thousands. Deep learning refers to using of multi layer neural networks. Like I said here, see here I only have two layers because so this is a very shallow neural network. 
And we they can go really deep. Like I said, they can be a billion uh, layers in the middle. Just like the architecture of ChatGPT and Gemini and all these uh, large language, a lot of these large language models, right? The role of the GPU here, the GPU excels at handling vast amounts of image data, especially image data. Like I said, it's graphical processing, making them preferred hardware for deep learning algorithms. And also, if, if you guys get in the future to work in, in machine learning or something, you're gonna be using something like Amazon Web Services, machine learning services or something, you're gonna have to select a GPU depending on, on how, how complex your work is. Like let's say you're, you're, you're training it on 5,000 pictures of dog. You're gonna have to use like a, a small GPU or something, right? Which you're gonna pay money for because you know, it takes a lot of electricity. But if I'm training it on like uh, something to, to create molecules and very com more complex stuff, you're gonna have to make a choice of like a higher GPU, much higher GPU to make these calculations. Yes. So GPUs can contain higher data sets of images, correct? Are you? Yes. So do they utilize GPUs in like camera systems as well? Camera systems? Yeah. Oh yeah, because absolutely. Uh, yeah. There's little chips inside cameras these days that that process all this stuff. Got it. So it produces to you like in, in higher in higher resolutions. Now we have 4K, 8K, they're going up to like 36K now. It's, it's crazy, right? Yeah. So as for conclusion, advances in, in processing technology, particularly GPUs, have revolutionized deep learning, enabling, enabling neural networks to learn from more deeply and refined outcomes with increased layers and complexity. This connection between neural architectures and GPU design is for So continuing on to the perceptron, like we said, is the simplest uh, of neural networks we used. Last week, we talked about uh, uh, weights and biases, right? So going back here, this is, this is what happens inside the, the deeper neural networks now. We're going to have to sum all the inputs and all the weights and the biases. So basically, going back here, give an example. So each one of these here has its own weights and biases, right? We talked about weights and biases last week, right? So we're gonna have to take the sum of all the layers and all their their uh, their weights and biases, right? And so just just one fact here just to, to show you guys some kind of some intuition about it. All right. So this is this is the this is what we're using. Now we're gonna talk about the activation functions, which is like uh, a push through from one neuron to the other, to the next. And uh, here we sum all the inputs, all the weights, all the bias. So you like math, right? So this is the math happening behind this, right? You know, sigma is the summation, right? Sigma is the summation of all inputs, weights, and biases. All right. So the pursuit of understanding the human brain has been central to developing AI, like I said, because it all comes from the neurons inside of our heads. See how they were connected to each other? Input here, output here, input here, output here. And this is how the brain works, basically. All right. Understanding the perceptron, its foundational model that serves the basis for more complex neural networks. Like I said, this is the simplest. Perceptron is the simplest neural, net neural network that we made. Basically, back in the 50s. It operates as a machine learning algorithm, which is a, a mathematical construct that establishes a function relating to inputs and outputs, like we said here. Inputs are going here, our output y here. So our output y depends on all these parameters here, our input, the weights, and the biases. So for subtron functional steps, the network diagram, the perceptron can be visualized through a, a network diagram that breaks down the, these functional steps, uh, function description. It can also be described as a mathematical function that maps inputs to outputs. This mathematical function, I just saw you guys right here. An example problem here would be a scientific problem. Let's consider a practical example related to science, such as building a baking soda and a vinegar volcano. That's one of the examples they use here. 
to determine how high a mixture will shoot out the volcano, input parameters can be like what? Uh, X1, X2, and, and then you know, all the Xs, like I said, are gonna be our inputs. Where, where the number, yes. Um, so I was looking at the diagram and I noticed that uh, you have like these descriptions for each thing. For example, X is the uh, variable the input, you have G is the bias, then you have the sum, output. What's the um, little like zigzag line? The E? The E, yeah. It's, the, it's a summation. An algebra, no, no, the one right next to it. What, what are you talking about? This one? Yeah, this so one? if you look at the diagram to the left, the yellow one with the kind of zigzag line. Here? Yeah, what's that? Oh, that's a summation, like I said. And the summation is what? What is it? The, the next one, the next circle. Oh, this one? Yeah, so what is that? I don't know. This is really, but uh, <laughs> I put the picture in as a, as a just to show you guys an example. So like I, think, I think it's another mathematical symbol, but this here is a summation of all the layers in the middle. Yeah, I was just, I was just wondering like, what would that? This this might be this might be a like a processing. Yeah, processing. Could be processing. But this one is a summation of all the layers in the yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So, yeah. like, like it shows here, summation of the uh, inputs, weights, and the bias. Got it? Got it? Thank you. Okay. Okay. So like I said here, the perceptron uh, represents a key advancement in modeling of artificial neural networks, mimicking biological neurons, like I said. By establishing a relationship between inputs and outputs, it lays the groundwork for more complex neural architectures used, used in modern uh, AI applications. Understanding the basic functionality of the perceptron will, 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 uh, will give you a good grasp on, on more sophisticated models in the future we're going to be looking at. Actually, I'm going to work, I'm going to actually ask you guys to bring your laptops next week, I mean next Thursday, and we're going to work on something together. So did you want to ask a question? No. So by studying the perceptron, which is the basic foundation of a neural, neural networks, we gain insight into the foundational concepts of neural networks, emphasizing the importance of input variables and their impact on output in machine learning models. All right. So like I said here, we took the baking soda volcano we saw that the machine readable, we need, it needs machine readable output, machine readable, uh, I mean input and output, like we said last week. A reasonable belief it could be a mathematical function connecting the alienating data points. So, like I said here, parameters of input here can be what? Amount of baking soda, amount of vinegar, uh, volume of volcano cavity, speed of mixing. And our output could be the height of the, the volcanic eruption, right? And this is this is sim a simple explanation for our, for our neuron here. Like I said here, like I said, for example, the cars. Uh, we said weight of the car, uh, the, its horsepower, and other things can be input. In this example, we're taking the amount of baking soda, amount of vinegar, volume of the volcano cavity, the speed of mixing, and our output here is going to be the volcanic eruption. We know from chemistry and physics that the amount of pressure created by the mixture will have an effect on the height of the eruption, right? So if we train a model to let us, to like, uh, that's supposed to predict the height of a volcanic eruption, in this case, we're gonna use these parameters and we use. So if we use more baking soda or, or add more vinegar, volcanic eruption can increase, right? In this, in this case. So moving on. Now the input nodes here, like I said, you guys see here the input nodes, it's it's summing them up all of them, right? And then there's the activation function, which is like the function pushing from one neuron to the other. We talked about one example of them, the sigmoid, last week, remember that? The sigmoid function, yeah. the, S, the S curve, right? The variables here, uh, we can say, like, recall the variables we discussed from previous slides, from previous classes, to the input parameters for a volcano experiment. Each variable corresponds to a node in the network, right? 
like I so, like I showed you guys, like uh, each one of those was its own node and own own uh, neuron, right? For the weights and inputs, each input is associated with a weight, like we said. Each neuron, like I told you guys, has its own weight, uh, uh, its own equation, right? Weight, bias, input. And then we sum it all up in this equation right here, all right? For the summation and bias, after multiplying each input and its correspondent weights, we sum these products like we see here in this equation, right? So by capital sigma, we know that this is for summation right here from algebra and, and calculus. The activation function takes the sum from the previous layers and as an input. It determines whether the neuron should be activated or not, basically. So it can it can move on from this neuron to this neuron, but the activation function can then like say, okay, this neuron is not gonna work this time. So we're gonna move on to another one, right? Like I said, going back here, they all have their own activation. So it can have like the activation function here. If it's gonna, if, if this one is gonna get activated or not based on weights and biases, like I said, or if this neuron's not gonna get activated, or if this neuron's not gonna get activated. That's the basic idea. Let's get into the model training. So training a neural network involves feeding data points through the network functions. To achieve accurate predictions, we must determine the right features and parameters, like I said. The training process consists of three main steps. Forward propagation, error computation, and then back propagation. Forward propagation is going to be our normal, uh, like I said, the Wx plus b. Weight, input, bias. Y equals weight, input, bias. This is forward propagation, right? Error computation, like I said, like we said, is going to be the cost function. I showed you guys that on a, on a graph last week, right? To see, if we want to minimize the cost function as much as we can, right? Back propagation is going to use the derivative, right? So instead of Wx plus b, it's going to be dw. You know what the derivative is, right? Right, right now, it's going to be dw uh, plus dx plus db. So not right now, it's going to go back to see if there's errors or not to make its adjustments for the weights and biases, like we talked about last week. And I'll explain to you uh, anything you want through the emails, or we can make it some. And I have everything up explained easily on the on the last slides, so you can take a look at the slides. Like I said, forward propagation is the process of sending data through the model from left to right. So it's going like this way, right here. So it's going through left to right here. It's doing the summation, giving us our output. Right. Back propagation is the opposite. It's going to take it. It's going to take it backwards. It's like it's like patrolling. You know what I mean? You're patrolling a street, so you're you're a cop or something. You're going this way forward, right? And then you take it back to see if there's something else happening in the street or not again, right? So it's like taking it back to see if there's errors or not, and then makes these uh, uh, balancing in the weights and bias, right? Okay. Right. Second step is error computation. Using an algorithm called the gradient descent, which I'll show you guys in the next uh, slides. Uh, this this gradient descent uh, is is to, to check for, for errors in, in the, while going back. The model. the model adjusts its parameters, weights and biases, as I said, to minimize the error. We're always, always trying to minimize error in cost functions. Gradient descent is a calculus-based algorithm leverage, leveraging properties such as the power and chain rule. Analogy, imagine navigating in the dark. Each step provides information to guide you to the next move. Right? So th this is a good analogy for it. If you're walking in the dark and each step is like, you know, okay, I, I can't see this. So there's something in front of me. It's the same analogy here. Back propagation, like I said, in some models, prop back propagation adjusts the parameters by using information from the cost function, which we're trying to reduce here. Think of it as stepping back to reassess your position and improve accuracy. Same thing we talked about last week. Back, back propagation is taking it back for derivatives, right? To see if, uh, if there's any errors or not and minimize the cost function. Very, very straightforward. 
All right. Each neuron function consists of, like we said, input, the weights, and the biases, which we talked about. The weight is the signal strength passed to the next neuron. The biases constant for fine tuning. Weights and biases are adjusted during training, analogous to tuning knobs uh, for precision, just like tuning knobs on our TV or anything else for precision, right? Like, just like tuning the guitar, like I said to you. But here, in this case, every neuron is its own guitar, its own everything, right? And I'll show you this, and I'll show you guys this in code, actually. And we're going to code it uh, together, maybe this week or next week. So we're going to do it together, actually. For the activation functions, it limits the output to specific ranges, like I said, 0 to 1. We said the sigmoid, right? Saw the S-curve. And, and the sigmoid... This is the sigmoid right here as for an activation. This is the sigmoid like this. It has this s curve kind of shape. But there's another activation that I use a lot, actually more than the sigmoid, which is called ReLU. The ReLU takes a straight line, basically. Total straight line. Same thing, but it's total straight line. And, and it gets things done quicker and quicker in models sometimes. They're better than the sigmoid for activation. And then there's a leaky ReLU, and there's there's other, there's a lot of other activation functions on there. They enable the computation of non-linear linear relationships within the network. Example of that is the step function and softmax function. Useful for the softmax is the mostly used in classification problems, and it's uh, and it's mostly at the output layer. So softmax basically can like uh, they only keep it at an activation at the output layer sometimes, and uh, and uh, it's mostly used for images and stuff like that. Like to keep, like it's it's put at the output layer to determine like whether cat or dog, cat or dog. Like, or uh, softmax is, is actually used for multiple classifications. It can be a hundred things: cat, dog, eagle, or this or that. That's one of the. It's one of the most important ones actually to protect for activation. Different activation functions are suited for different tasks based on relationships between input, features, and outputs. Importance of, act of the activation functions, they allow for modeling complex nonlinear relationship, essential for deep learning. Activation functions are vital component in neural networks as they influence how well the model learns and generalizes. Conclusion here, on this understanding feed forward processes and activation function is crucial for grasping deep learning concepts. While these foundation ideas are a significant ongoing advancement for being to shape the field. Any questions so far? Everyone good? You guys got a grasp? This this is all just to spark your intuition, right? I'm not trying to give you the the complex the very complex math behind deep learning because the theory is extremely complex, right? But this is gonna like spark your intuition and and uh, it's going to show what's important actually for the future of this stuff. Like, you're, you guys are not going to have to go back and learn, like, the extremely complex math, unless you guys want to be, like, uh, PhD holders in deep learning or something, and then, you know, make research and stuff like that, you know? But if you're trying to build models and do this and that, I don't think you guys are going to need to know the extremely complex theory. So, moving on. Simple neural networks here. And we gave an example here as a Sharkawi. I think Jessica put this as an example because it was like a, a robotics company or something like that. Yeah, she did. This, is, this one is about robotics, as you guys can see here. So we're going to see how a simple neural network works in robotics. You see how these hidden layers are? This is, this is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10. Uh, you have 10 inputs here. And we have... And two, we have two hidden layers. Each one is four neurons. Like I said, each one has its own weights and biases formulas, right? Each one of these neurons has its own weights and biases formula. Each act, each one has its own, and each layer has its own activation, right? So definition. Uh, a simple neural network is the basic structure used for processing input and calculating results. The neuron serves as the smallest information processing unit comparable to a byte in computer science or a molecule in chemistry. Basically. 
So that's that's what a neuron serves as here. Like I said, one, two, three, four neurons here, one, two, three, four neurons here. A single neuron alone does not form a network. It is part of a more complex system. So for the structure of a simple neural network, early neural networks were typically single layers, like the perceptron like we saw. Single layer is a very shallow layer um, and people, no looping. As we're gonna see looping in, in, in recurring neural networks in the next slide, next two slides. A simple neural network usually consists of three layers, like we said, our input layer, no computation occurs in the input layer. It's just the input, like I said. It can be text, it can be pictures, it can be anything, right? Our hidden layers, like I said, are the ones in the middle. This is where the complexity of learning occurs and where significant computations take place. Take place. The output layer produces our final result. Like I said, uh, you're using ChatGPT, uh, but ChatGPT is like a very deep model. It might have like trillion layers or something. So uh, you're asking a question, that's the input. This is the axis, the hidden layer, that's where everything is happening. Output layer is where you get your answer. So ChatGPT works all its magic inside, all these neurons are connected like you guys see here. And then, you know, it gives you your output, yes. Um, doesn't like ChatGPT also have like all internet stored information in it? Yes, so you can access. Yes. So like, how is it possible to store so much well, it's, it's updated. It's always updated. Because when I was thinking about this, because I, I was using it today, I was thinking, uh, does it, for each person, let's say you have an account, does, for each person, does it like recycle the information? Like, let's search something up and it will grab it from some data set and put it back into your layers? Yes. Or does it just have everything in your layers? Well, that's the thing. They, 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 it kind of, it's like unleashing a beast. On all the information in the world on the internet, in the internet. But would they contain all that information in some sort of data sense where, for example, I would ask something about football and then it would like enter that data set, which is multiple layers in it? Mm -hmm. Or does it just have everything in one data set and everything's like that? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's fetching from every everywhere. Okay. You know what I mean? It's 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 already trained on all this information. Got it. And and that's the thing. I think now they're trying to make it uh, update itself daily. To know. All right, guys, for this simple neural, neural network, like I said, it connects with robots and, you know, uh, adjust forms of the robot's joints and movements and motion, basically. All right, let's start on first kind of recurrent neural uh, is the recurrent neural networks, RNNs, right? Why do we call them recurrent? Because they keep taking the text or the input and putting it through the neurons multiple times, over and over and over again, until it reaches your best uh, desired output, basically. That's why they're called the recurrent neural networks. So, and gradient descent, like I said here, so it's getting here, minimizing the cost function. Gradient descent is one of those algorithms that you know adjusts all of this by putting it in a curve, making them closely aligned to each other, minimizing the cost function. Here, this is what gradient descent is basically. And this, this is a recurrent neural network. So this is the whole network, and this is dissected. Okay. Then we put our input X, it's gonna go through the network again and again. And again and again, basically, until you until it gives you your uh, the result or the output, right? So right here for the recurrent neural networks, their type of neural network designed to process sequential data. They're mostly used for speech and and writing and texts. So it's giving it like if you're giving a, a phone speech like Siri, that's a recurrent neural network uh, going on right there. And, and same thing with the large language models. You give it a text and it keeps recurring that text or, or speech or any whatever it is through that network multiple times until it gives you a good output. All right. B 
featuring feedback loops that allow them to use information from previous inputs. So it keeps going through a cycle inside the networks. The key distinction between recurrent neural networks and simple neural networks is the looping mechanism that enables the network to remember, pass on, or forget data from sources. So basically it's gonna keep going through, putting that input through that network multiple times, forget what it needs to forget, what's not, what's not needed, uh, uh, resetting what's needed, and, and basically it works like that. Example of usage, natural language modeling, understanding and generating human language, like I said, giving it human languages and speech, it, it can, uh, it'll, it, that's what they put in, uh, in translators, is a recurrent neural network. Text generation, producing coherent text based on given input. So basically, just like I said, recurrent neural networks, they keep taking text for the input and recycling it inside the neural network on and on. And another example of them is something called a bidirectional neural network, which keeps recurring, it keeps recurring in both directions. You know, it keeps taking it in both directions. It gives it more, uh, a little more of an amplified results here. So like I said, recurrent neural networks, the input is being recycled inside, cycled through the gates of the network, basically. Its disadvantage is gradient issues. It's prone to vanishing and exploding gradients, which I'm gonna show you guys in the next slide, where gradients become uh, too small or too large during training, making it difficult for a network to learn anything effective, basically. It's training difficulty also, they're really too difficult to train. It can be challenging due to complexity of feedback loops and need for sequential data. Like I said, sequential data is what? Like language, like like um, like me talking to you guys right now. It's, it's in a sequence, right? The words are in a sequence, everything's in a sequence. So basically that's what we call them sequence models. Data requirements for optimal performance for these models to work. Data should be sequential, like I said which can complicate the modeling of non-sequential data patterns. Summary, recurrent neural networks represent a significant advancement over simple neural networks by incorporating loops that enable memory and context and processing sequences. Despite their advantages, they face challenges in training and gradient management, highlighting the need for careful consideration in their application and design. All right, this is recurrent neural networks. Recurrent, like I said, you guys know the word recurrent means it keeps happening. Basically. Long short term memories, that's a type of, uh, of recurrent neural networks, but it's a different uh, type of recurrent neural networks. Like I said, you see guys here, the vanishing gradients and exploding gradients. Uh, exploding gradient is going to keep like training and doing it until it gets out of hand, basically. Vanishing gradient, it like, the model like totally vanishes and stops training when it stops training. So this is like vanishing, this is exploding, right? Exploding, it gets out of hand, it doesn't train effectively, it vanishes, totally dissembles it, also gets out of hand, it doesn't train the model, right? LSTMs, their type, a specialized type of recurrent neural networks designed to overcome the vanishing gradient problem so it's designed to overcome these problems right here that might be caused by a simple recurrent neural network. LSTMs maintain memory over long sequences and are particularly effective in processing sequential data such as text and speech, like me talking to you guys right now and, and text being typed in. They consist of memory cells and are three critical gates, the input gate, the output gate, and the forget gate. Like I said, the forget gate gets rid of the, it's recurring, like I said, and there's a forget gate in there in the network where it forgets like the some of the sequence, some of the data in the sequence that's not needed, basically. So it saves us computation and time and, and a lot of things and gets rid of this uh, gradient problem, gradient descent problem. All right, example of usage. Uh, they're widely used in, in a lot of applications like language simulation, generating coherent text based on context. So basically based on context is like, uh, I am going to drink a uh, dot. You can give it that to the, to, a, to the recurrent neural, neural network and then in the morning, 
it's supposed to figure it out, right? Like it's gonna figure out milk, orange juice, something like that. That's one of the uses of you know, recurrent neural networks in long-term tools. Yes. Um, so basically what this does is it takes some information and it stores it in memories and eventually it connects it. It, it keeps, like I said, it's a, it's a specialized type of recurrent neural network. Yeah. So it has this forget gate. Yeah, right? so it keeps the information, memorizes it, and then when it's not needed, it forgets it. Yes, absolutely. But like for the voice recognition, for example, if I run in a simulation with that, mm -hmm. I speak, but then for a period of time, I stop speaking, it's just silence. Mm -hmm. When they forget my voice, so how do you forget your voice? Yeah, because if a voice recognition, for example, you're recognizing my voice, correct? Mm -hmm. But if I don't speak for a certain amount of time, when it run through all that memory and forget it because it thinks it's not necessary anymore? Uh, yes. Yeah. So then it would forget. It would that's that's the point. Of human voice. It's it, the point is is actually not to. It's not going to forget the 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 important information. It's gonna it's gonna like drop drop certain things in the input that are not needed as it goes through the cycle. Okay. You know what I mean? It's a little complex, you know, but uh, that's that's kind of the idea. Uh, I'm gonna. It's gonna it's, I'm gonna talk about it in the next slide. Another type of uh, recurrent neural networks. So for handwriting analysis, also recognizes interpreting hand handwritten characters. It knows all the letters, all the characters, basically. Time series predictions, forecasting future values by learning relationships between past and present data. Its advantages: enhanced memory capacity. They can retain information over extended periods, making them suitable for task requiring contextual awareness. Improved performance, they effectively handle sequential dependencies, allowing more accurate predictions in language and time uh, series tasks. Uh, mitigating gradient issues, like I said, it gets rid of these exploding and vanishing gradients, basically, in the, while, while we're training the model. Facilitating better training over long sequences. Because like I said, guys, you always put in mind that we're going to be using resources, right? Time and money to train a model. So we have to be really careful which type of neural network we choose and, and what we're choosing it for. Like if we're just using a regular recurrent neural network and feeding it very complex data that might require an LSTM, it's gonna, it, might, it might waste a lot of time and money for you, and it might not get the job done, right? To summarize, they are a powerful extension of RNNs, of recurrent neural networks, providing the ability to remember and process sequential data more uh, effectively. While they offer significant advantages in handling uh, complex tasks, they also pose challenges related to overfitting, computational demands, and interoperability, underscoring the need for careful applications and AI models. So you have to choose carefully what kind of neural network you use. Now, it's the same concept here is a gated recurrent network. Uh, it's just like the LSTM, but it has a, it has an extra update and reset gates. So basically, like I said, guys, it's like it's like a maze where where the data is going through different gates, right, and getting processed differently at each uh, at each stage. Since we don't have a lot of time. Make this quick for you guys. Uh, they're an advanced version of recurrent neural networks designed to retain memory and, and mitigate the gradient vanishing problem. Also, trying to get rid of these gradient vanishing and exploding problems. GRUs utilize update and reset gates to control the flow of information, allowing the model to decide what data to keep, like I said, and what data to discard. So, it says you were asking, right? All right. For each iteration. There's an update gate. It determines which information from the previous state should be kept. And the reset gates decides how much to pass information to forget. Like, like you guys can see here, it's these gates right there. In the current neural network. X is our input, H is our output. It's a little complex of, a, of an architecture, but that's, that's kind of its basic idea. Example of usage. Uh, language modeling, enha enhancing text generation and context understanding, machine language translation, improves translation accuracy by considering context, always takes context into uh, mind. Speech recognition, better interpreting and converting spoken language into text. Time series analysis, analyzing and predicting patterns and sequential data. 
which is bandages, it has efficient memory retention. GRUs can hold information for a long time, long term. Simplicity, they have a simpler architecture than LSTMs with fewer parameters. Effective gradient handling, they take care of these uh, vanishing and exploding gradients, as we said. Okay. Some of its disadvantages, uh, overfitting, like LSTMs, GRUs, which are gated recurring units here, like I said. Uh, they're simpler than LSTMs, still operate like a black box model, making their internal working difficult to interpret sometimes. Contextual limitations, while they handle sequential data, they may not capture all complexities and in the context. Summary, GRUs offer powerful alternative to recurrent neural networks and LSTMs, effective ma memory management and gradient vanishing problem management. They, uh, their application spans a uh, wide uh, through like uh, most uh, natural language processing and time series analysis for consideration regarding overfitting and retrievability. Next, autoencoders and, and variational autoencoders here. Okay, for the definition, I wanna go through this quick actually because it's still kind of hard. If there's anything left for today, we'll, we'll discuss it next next uh, Thursday because it's a, it's a shorter, uh, it's a short lecture, but I'm gonna do some hands-on work with you guys. So make sure to bring your laptop. Awesome. Autoencoders, they're a type of neural network also used for unsupervised learning that compresses data into lower dimensional. That's what we call it encoding, just like using uh, compression programs like uh, WinRAR. You guys use WinRAR at all? Like to extract something from a file. You guys never extracted a raw file or a zip file? A zip file, yeah. Zip files and raw files. You know how they're compressed? compressed yeah. Right? It can be like 10 gigabytes outside, but inside it's like uh, one gigabyte yeah. when you download it, right? It's, it's, kind, of the, it's kind of like this uh, yeah. kind of uh, idea here, right? So our encoders, uh, they're unsupervised, so they're using unlabeled data, like we said to lower dimensional representations, which is called encoding here, and then reconstruct the data into uh, decoding, like compressing, decompressing, right? Like we said, encoding, decoding, basically. They aim to find meaningful, meaningful patterns in data through latent variables, which are hidden features that characterize the data. And then there's variational autoencoders. They're, they're a little more advanced than autoencoders, they use a probabilistic approach to estimate these latent variables, allows more nuanced uh, representation of the data. All right. Examples of usage, image generation. Variational autoencoders can generate new images by learning an underlying distribution of existing images. Drug discovery used in pharmaceuticals. You know, like now they have uh, text to image uh, models, right? I can write, generate um, a, a picture of uh, a cat jumping in a pool or something like that, right? And it's going to generate one, right? That's a variational autoencoder working in the back end. Drug discovery saying, use the pharmaceuticals to generate new molecular structures by modeling the distribution of known compounds. So it's, they basically also use them to make new medications. Uh, from using the mo molecules it was trained on. And anomaly detection, identifying unusual data points and data sets. Its advantages, uh, data compression, like I said, it can uh, decrease, <laughs> decrease the dimensions of the data to make it a little more you know, uh, manageable. Generative capabilities, it can produce new diverse outputs that resemble the training data, linking space exploration, Allows exploration of learned latent space to identify patterns and clusters of data. So it can be used in clustering, basically. Like I said, it's unsupervised, so it's using unlabeled data. All right. Disadvantages, uh, you know, it can sometimes be unclear or unrealistic outputs. Sometimes it's very complex uh, training for autoencoders, you know, since they're also working on pictures and, and images and graphic data. Alternative methods, such as uh, alternative methods, 
For certain applications, such as high quality image generation, uh, GANs may, uh, may outperform GAEs. We didn't talk about GANs, which are generated by the Next, uh, Next slide. Summary, autoencoders and VAEs play a significant role in unsupervised learning and generative AI, providing powerful tools for data representation and pattern recognition. While they have many applications and advantages, their limitation in output quality and training complexity uh, should be carefully considered because they also consume a lot of resources. I'll, I'll skip the, the Bolton machine. Actually. Might talk to you. Generative adversarial neural networks. So they're called what? Generative adversarial neural networks. There are two neural adversarial comes from the word adversary. You guys know what that means? An adversary? You guys know what the word means? Like an enemy, like two things working against each other, right? Yes. The, the generative uh, adversarial neural networks, it's a class of machine learning frameworks that consists of a generator and a discriminator, and they're working against each other. So that's why it's called uh, generative adversarial, because two things are working against each other. The generator produces synthetic data from random noise based on the training data set. Then the discriminator evaluates the data generated by the generator and distinguishes between real and fake data by feedback from for, for, uh, for improvement, which is actually a, a very good architecture that's like correcting itself, right? It's, it's, two net, it's two networks working against each other. Like I said, the generator and the discriminator and, and they're both like correcting each other. The discriminator is correcting, all, always correcting what the generator uh, generates, right? That's his basic idea. Example of usage, image generation, also creating realistic images in art, like the models of today. You write, I want an image of something and it generates it for you, right? Video generation, now they have video generation. Okay, make me a video of uh, someone doing this and that you know, dressed in this and that. We do that also. 3D modeling, generating 3D images from various applications. Music generation, you can make music out of it. Composing new music tracks. Yes. Uh, do you know what OpenCV is? OpenCV? Yeah, does OpenCV utilize us as well? Or, uh, What's an OpenCV? It's like a, it's like a machine learning program that allows you to access your video camera from the platform. Open CV? Yeah, I never heard about that. Um, I was wondering if generative uh, is, is a newer network that it probably does. <laughs> What's its function? Like, what does it uh, do? It basically accesses the webcam from your laptop mm -hmm. in order to get a live feed. Oh, Open CV? Yeah, I never heard about it. But if it's if it's using like uh, complex video and, and data, yeah. and image data, it could be using. It, it uses like multiple data sets. It captures the live feed from your camera. Mm -hmm. and it uses nice data sets and it portrays it as a stream. So you can see the live action. Yeah, it might, it might, it might have been to this. Absolutely, yeah. Music creation, confusing, it composes new music tracks. I actually trained a model uh, using this to, uh, I gave it like five jazz uh, tracks. It trained on these five jazz tracks and then I asked it to create a new jazz track out of it. So it made a totally different track out of these five tracks I trained it on, which was awesome, actually. And I'm going to show you this uh, maybe next uh, Thursday. So advantages, high quality imagery. It produces images with very high quality. It's unsupervised learning. It doesn't require labeled data. Like we said, it's on labeled data. Self-training can generate new training data, enabling continuous improvement. Like I said, it, it improves itself. The generator generates, the discriminator corrects. The generator generates, the discriminator corrects. That's basically how it's working. It's, it's fixing it. It's just like our human mind, right? You're fixing like your thoughts, or what you think about something, or what you don't think about something. It's, it's kind of how it works. It's amazing, actually. A disadvantage uh, can be challenging due to competitive nature of generators and, uh, and discriminators. You know, they're working against each other. Give us this nice uh, product at the end. 
computational expense, it requires significant computational resources and time. So this might be the one that requires the most significant computation and time since we have this generator and discriminator working against each other, right? So generated by adversarial neural networks, they require significant computational resources, but they produce high quality outputs. Mode collapse, the generator may produce limited variety of outputs resulting in duplication of images. That's another one of its, so uh, replication basically, which uh, is not needed in this scenario. GANs, which is short for them, we call them GANs. They represent a powerful tool in the realm of generative modeling capable of producing stunningly realistic outputs across various media, pictures, uh, audio, music, whatever it is. You can train your own model to make your own music, basically. It's, it's, it's amazing, right? However, careful management of training dynamics and data variety is essential to overcome these inherent challenges and maximize their effectiveness. Convolutional neural networks, my favorite, which I'll talk about. Uh, I think I'll end with convolutional neural networks here. Convolutional neural networks are basically the neural network type of neural design for processing structured grid data, such as images, unlike the current neural networks. You know, they don't use sequence, uh, sequence of data. CNNs are not like RNNs, basically. They're discriminative models uh, that use feed forward architecture, a convolution layer, pooling layer and a fully connected layer, basically. So here, convolutional neural network, what it's doing is, imagine this is a picture. There's a, there's a picture inside these pixels, right? All these pictures have, uh, all these pixels right here have a picture inside of them. And, and this is the first pixel in the picture, which is like top corner of the, pic the picture, right? So this is the second, third, fourth pixel. And this is convolving. That's why we call it convolutional, right? It's convolving, so it's going through all these picture, uh, pictures using a filter. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six. This is a six by six picture, okay? And it filters them using a three by three filter. So it decompresses them smaller for the neural network to take care of it, right? And it's convolving through all the pixels, right? You see how the box moved one, one, uh, one, one to the side here, and then it moved in the middle here. See, and then it's going to come down here, make the same movements. It's being filtered through these filters right here, three by three filters, until it becomes smaller. So this, the result here is the same as this, but it got filtered by a uh, three by three filter. Although it's a six by six picture, right? But I'm not going to throw that into the model and make it harder on it, right? So we use convolutional neural networks. It's convolving through the pixels of the picture or, or image you're, you're giving it, right? Filtering it and giving you a smaller result here, right? That's, that's this basic idea, convolving. It's convolving through the pixels and, and filtering it. It has three layers, the convolutional layer, this is the one that extracts the, uh, the features from the input the image through the convolution operations. These are the convolution operations you guys see right there, filtering it. And then the pooling layer, it reduces the spatial dimensions also. So this is a pool picture. This is the regular picture. And it got pulled into a smaller dimension, right? So we applied a three by three filter to a six by six picture, and it gave us a four by four picture four by four result, all right? That's the pooling layer. And then the fully connected layer is the final layer where it makes the output decision, whether it's a picture of a dog, whether it's a picture of a cat, whether it's a picture of a bird. <coughs> That's why it makes its last uh, decision. Examples of use. Uh, image recognition, identifying objects, faces, and scenes and images, natural language pro processing, analyzing text data for sentiment ana analysis, speech recognition, understanding spoken language, automotive industry, applications like uh, lane detection and obsolete. Actually, some driving cars are based on 
CNNs. So it's a camera on the car taking pictures all the time uh, at million, at nanoseconds, right? Taking pictures of everything around it, the surrounding, and processing this inside the model that's installed in the car. It's, it's basically a CNN model. Social media pictures like tagging friends or photo, photos. Advantages here would be feature extraction. It automatically extracts important features from images. Uh, it has a lot of applications, can be applied to the various tasks, computer vision, natural language processing, high performance, excels in handling large data sets. Disadvantages, overfitting due to their complexity. They're very complex to train. So you can have some overfitting problems. And they're computationally intensive. They require significant computational resources also, just like the generating uh, adversarial method. And I think I'll end here today, guys. It's a, a convolution. There's five minutes left. Uh, would you guys like to ask any questions? Any questions, you all? Everything's good and clear today? So for homework, uh, this one is exciting, actually. I want you guys to use a chat GPT or Gemini or whatever large language model you have out there. and I'm gonna actually uh, put it on the homework thing on on, um, on Google Classroom. I want you to use ChatGPT or or whatever it is you, know, you use Gemini, ChatGPT. There's a lot of them out there now, and uh, create a function that can uh, in Python that can uh, take small letters and turn them to capital letters, right? So you're gonna go ask ChatGPT, generate a Python function for me that can take uh, small letters and capital letters, right? And also ask it to give you all the libraries necessary for it to run, right? I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna put a sheet online and then you guys are gonna take a snap of the result or your output. You're gonna run it through uh, a Jupyter notebook and you're gonna just take a snap of that result and give it back to me. All right, sounds good, awesome. You guys work with Python all yet? You did? You use functions and stuff? And, and it's just like very simple Python. Java? Okay. Well, we're not, we're not gonna use Java because Java's, uh, it's, it's more like a compiled language Python is the one mostly used in machine learning, but I will give you the I'll, I'll put the I'll put the sheet up on online, and you guys can take a look at it. And I'll give you directions actually how to use it. And then do you guys use the Jupyter notebooks at all yet? Jupyter notebooks, nobody uses them. I'll give you directions on there. All you have to do is get when you get the result out and run the function. You're gonna take a snap of it. And uh, like, a pic you know how to snap pictures out of something? You take a snap of it, and then you give it back to me. And then next week, I might go through, uh, it's gonna help you guys through the project because by the end, you, you, each one of you is going to train his own model, right? So I'm gonna make you guys leave this course of data scientists, machine learning, <laughs> machine learning engineers, basically. So, It'll, it'll be uh, very good, and uh, it's going to be a really good thing to show also on, on your guys' resumes and that you built a machine learning model. That's that's going to be a really good thing. Yes? When is it due? Today. Like the first part. The first part is due today? Yeah. Did you guys read it? Yeah, I brought it up. I'm just like a little confused. So yes. Got it. Oh, so the first part of the project, you'll read it and and uh, and see what the requirements are. You're not starting the project yet. You're still just gathering information. It's gonna ask you what's the project for, uh, what is it intended, what's gonna happen if it's, it's not implemented. Like let's say you choose a project of a model that uh, you're gonna train a model that you know. 
right? Like, you know, a simple model, like, you know, to, to get the quality of cheese or wine or something like that, you, you download a data set, right? Uh, you just talk about it, basically. It's not gonna, it's not that hard, you know? Like, what's the problem the, a, a company needs? Uh, and it needs a, a, a model trained to like, uh, get the quality of their cheese or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. If the model is not trained correctly, the cheese might quality might have uh, might have bad, bad effects on the customers when it gets. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's not that hard. Don't don't put too much. I'm not looking for too much uh, information on there. I just want to see how you guys think. Your thought process. Basically, it's nothing. Like that. It's not hard. Don't put too much in there. Just simple, simple stuff. It's like I said. The course is just to spark your intuition. Right, you guys are gonna have this spark intuition. You're still in high school, which you guys are lucky. You're learning this, but you're still in high school. It's 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 a good thing, you know. I think it's illegal. But basically, this is uh, the end of tonight's class. Uh, see you guys on Thursday. All right? Everything good? All right. See you guys on Thursday. Babu, thank you very much. I really appreciate. It. I really appreciate what. Mouse, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. If you need anything? Just text me. Sure. On uh, your uh, thing, and me and Jessica will like, make sure you get uh, registered. Got it. Thank you. Got it. All right, man. Have a good night. Dude. Thank you.